Hi, Matthias from 10 Minute Physics here. Welcome to tutorial number 17. Today I'm going to show you how to write a scientific Eulerian fluid simulator with just 200 lines of JavaScript code. Let's start. Here you see my JavaScript Eulerian fluid simulator in action. The demo you see runs in a browser. I simulate how air is pushed into a wind tunnel from the left. To visualize the airflow, I also added smoke. There is an obstacle which creates this beautiful effect called vortex shedding. I can also move the obstacle with the mouse or by touch on a mobile device. I can visualize the streamlines and the pressure field. Here I subtract the smoke field from the pressure field which yields this artistic effect. This demo shows the hydrostatic pressure field in a water tank of a height of 1 meter. The simulator creates the expected linear pressure gradient with the correct pressure at the bottom, no matter where I place the obstacle. In this demo, the obstacle creates smoke, which I visualize using the scientific color scheme. Let me start with a few remarks. A fluid can actually be a liquid or a gas. Both have similar physical structures, so we can use the same method to simulate them. The name Eulerian comes from the famous Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler. Methods that use a grid for simulation are associated with him. He is most famous for the mathematical constant E, which is named after him. Methods that do not use a grid for simulation are associated with the Italian mathematician Joseph Louis Lagrange. We will look at a 2D simulation, however going from 2D to 3D is straightforward and I leave this as an exercise. For our simulations, we assume that the fluid is incompressible. Water is very close to being incompressible. If you apply a pressure of 10,000 kilos or the weight of a big truck on 1 cm squared, water will be compressed by only 3%. Incompressibility is also a reasonable assumption for the simulation of free gas. I might talk about compressible simulation in an upcoming tutorial. A second assumption we make is that the fluid is inviscid, which means there is zero viscosity. This is a good approximation for water and gases as well. Adding viscosity is quite simple though, and we'll talk about it in an upcoming tutorial. Now let us dive into the method. As mentioned, we will use a grid for simulation. In the grid, we store a velocity field. Velocity is a two-dimensional vector we write in bold phase V, which has two components, italic phase U and V. Here you see how a velocity field can be represented in a collocated grid with spacing H. We store the velocity vectors at the center of each cell. For fluid simulations, there is actually a better grid, the staggered grid. Here we store the velocity components in different locations. The horizontal components are stored at the center of the vertical cell faces. The vertical components are stored at the center of the horizontal cell faces. The nice thing about this arrangement is that we can now see how much fluid flows from one cell to its neighbor. Here we see an overview of the complete simulation algorithm. There are three steps. In the first step, we modify the velocity values based on external forces. We will only use gravity. In the second step, we make the fluid incompressible. This step is called projection. In the third step, we move the velocity field in the grid. This step is called advection. The first step is very simple. Here we go through all the grid cells ij and add delta t times g to the vertical component. g is the gravitational acceleration and dt is the time step size, for instance, 1 30th of a second. Now let's have a look at the second step, namely making the fluid incompressible. For this we need the concept of divergence. Divergence d is proportional to the total amount of fluid that leaves the cell in a time step. In a staggered grid, we simply sum up the velocities adjacent to one cell. We need to be careful though. If u i plus 1j on the right is positive, fluid leaves the cell. However, if uij on the left side is positive, fluid flows into the cell, so we need a negative sign there. Now if the divergence is positive, we have too much outflow. If it is negative, we have too much inflow. For an incompressible fluid, the divergence must be zero. Now let's see how we can force incompressibility. In this case, we have too much inflow. 
To fix this, we could simply change one velocity. However, a fluid cannot do this. A fluid can only push the velocities outward or pull them inward by the same amount. We use the simplest possible way to implement this. First we compute the divergence. Then we subtract one fourth of it from the four velocities. Again we have to be careful with the signs though. If you plug the updated velocities into the equation for the divergence, you see that it becomes zero. Handling obstacles and walls is very simple too. Let's assume there is an obstacle or wall on the left of cell ij. Now the velocity uij is fixed, so we can only modify the remaining three velocities to make the divergence zero. This time we use one third of the divergence as a correction. Typically for a wall, uij is zero. It can also be non-zero, for instance, if an object is moving. The method can also be used to simulate a turbine that pushes air into a wind tunnel as I showed you in the beginning. For the general case, we store a scalar value s in each cell and set it to zero for obstacles and to one for fluid cells. Here you see the general updates. Of course, we don't want to simulate one single cell. We want to simulate the entire grid. To do this, we iterate n times. In each iteration, we run through all the grid cells. For each cell, we perform the projection as discussed before. This method is called Gauss-Seidel. It is probably the simplest method to solve systems of equations. We have to be careful though. On the boundary, we access cells outside of the grid. One solution to this problem is to add border cells that we do not change. We either set them to walls or copy the values of neighbor cells that are inside the grid. When running a fluid simulation, we are typically interested in the pressure distribution inside the domain. To compute the pressure, we store a scalar pressure value inside each cell. Before starting the iterations, we set it to zero. Then after projection of each cell, we update the pressure value with this equation. Here, rho is the density of the fluid, h the grid spacing and delta t the time step size. Computing the pressure just provides additional information and is not necessary to run the simulation. As we just saw, Gauss-Seidel is very simple to implement. However, it needs more iterations to converge than global methods. Fortunately, there is a very simple trick to speed up convergence dramatically. It is called over-relaxation and works like magic. All we have to do is multiply the divergence by constant O between 1 and 2, the bigger the better. I use 1.9 in the code. In the demo I have a checkbox to turn it on and off. Let me go back to the tank demo. As we saw, we get the pressure gradient immediately. Now let me turn off over relaxation. And as you can see, the simulation completely collapses. Let's turn it on again and we get the correct pressure field again. The nice thing about over relaxation is that the pressure values are still correct. The last step of our simulation is advection. In a fluid, the velocity state is carried by particles, the atoms. However, while particles move, our velocity vectors are attached to a static grid. Therefore, we need to move the velocities inside the grid. A simple and stable method to do this is semi-Lagrangian advection. To update the horizontal velocity component u of a cell, for instance, we ask which fluid particle moved to the location where u is stored. Then we set the new velocity u t plus delta t to the velocity u t at the previous location. We do not actually work with particles, the moving particle is just an illustration of the idea. This is why the method is called semi-Lagrangian. But how can we compute this previous location? For this we first compute the full two-dimensional vector v at the location of the u component. Then the previous location can be approximated by x minus delta t times v. Here we assume a straight path. This simplification introduces viscosity though. There are a variety of methods to reduce this effect, for instance vorticity confinement. To compute the full two-dimensional vector v at the location of u, we need to compute the vertical component v bar in addition to the horizontal component u. This can be done by simply averaging the v values in the neighborhood. After going back, we need the velocity at an arbitrary location in the grid. This time we compute a weighted average of the surrounding values. These equations look a little bit more involved but are very simple to implement. Just have a look at the code. As you saw in the demo, I simulate smoke to visualize the flow. Fortunately, we don't need a simulation for this at all. All we need is already stored in the velocity field. 
I simply store a density value between 0 and 1 in each cell. Then I add vect it just as I did for the velocity components. In particular, to compute the new density value in a cell, I use the velocity at the center of this cell. Then I walk back along the straight line and interpolate the density field at the previous location. Visualizing streamlines is simple too. Here I set the position variable x to an initial location and choose a step size s. Then for n steps I first sample the velocity field at x and update x by adding s times v to it. Now let's have a look at the code. The simulator is implemented in the class fluid. It starts at line 90 and ends at line 290, so 200 lines as I promised. Advact smoke is not even a part of the simulator. In the constructor I initialize all the necessary fields like the U and V fields, the pressure field and the smoke field. In the integration step I simply add gravity times dt to the V components of all cells. Here is the projection method. I run multiple iterations and in each iteration I run through all the cells. I sum up all the s values, then I compute the divergence and multiply it by the over relaxation factor. Finally, I correct the velocity components. This is the advection method. Here I run through all the cells and update the u and the v component of the velocity field. To do this, I first compute the velocity at the location where u is stored. Then I perform the backward step and sample the field at this new location. The same for the v component. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Thanks for watching and I see you in the next one.